want us to begin this morning together in the Word, just reading our text, which today is 1 Peter chapter 3, and we'll read verses 18 through 22. If you join me there for a moment as we begin. 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. For Christ also suffered once for sins the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. I believe you have uh, listened to me long enough to know that I am not a preacher who sets out to upset people. That is not my goal as I get into the pulpit. I realize that today what I say will upset people. Maybe not people in this assembly necessarily, but some would be upset at what I am about to say. Actually, there are a couple of things, one major, one minor, that could upset people this morning. Number one, the major one, is that I'm going to say, in concert, of course, with what I believe the Word of God says, and in particular, what we just read from the Apostle Peter, inspired of the Holy Spirit of God, going to say that baptism now saves you. I know some of our neighbors in the religious world, that would upset, even offend. Maybe some here it would. I don't know, but I'm going to say that and not apologize for it. Number two, and less important, I am not going to take the temptation to delve deeply into that really difficult part of 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22, the part we're not sure about, the part about Jesus preaching to the spirits in prison. I will uh, address it briefly, but it's frankly one of the hardest sayings of the New Testament to explain, and the explanation is in the realm of opinion, and uh, there are just more important things here, matters of faith that are very clear that I want us to spend our time on. So 1 Peter, this letter in, in the New Testament, talks very much about what it means to live as the people of God in this world. That is his overarching theme. And there's information here about things like persecution and hard times and, and learning how to respond to those things uh, like the Lord Jesus Christ did. In this text that we read, we're shown how Jesus, despite the fact that he was arrested and tortured and hung on the cross and killed and indeed buried in a tomb, all of those awful things to experience, despite all that, he was raised from the dead, he was exalted, and he has gone into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. And everything, angels, authorities, powers, Everything has been subjected to him. All that awful stuff that happened to him was reversed by God. And, and one of the clear messages we can take from this is so it will be for all those who believe and, and live for Jesus. Indeed, you'll have hard times, you'll suffer. Who knows what the extent of that will be? But in the end, God will raise you up. He will exalt you. He will give you life eternal. 
This is, again, the overarching message throughout what we read a moment ago. But let's look at a couple of the details here. After our Lord died on the cross, Peter says in verse 18 that he was made alive in the spirit. He says he was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Now that makes sense, doesn't it? That his body died, but his spirit did not. He experienced a physical death, and he was raised then by the power of God to new life. But then we have this mysterious part in verses 19 and 20 that everybody likes to talk about and ask about. What does it mean when Peter says that Jesus went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison? What spirits and what prison? Um, and then as you read on, what does this have to do with the time of, of Noah? Well, there are a lot of suggested solutions to these questions, some of them good and some not so good. Um, and in fact, in, in looking at all of them, more than one of them makes sense and, and can be in harmony with the rest of God's word. I'm not gonna take time to go through all the possibilities this morning, that's not our place or purpose, but I will tell you what I believe, and I'll, I'll say up front that it is my studied opinion, and what I mean by that is I've studied it, and this is my opinion. But you know what they say about opinions? They're like armpits. Everyone has one, they all stink. Of course, mine doesn't stink. But what makes most sense to me, considering all the Bible, and all the context here in 1 Peter, is this. That Peter is simply saying to us that Jesus preached through Noah to the people of Noah's day. Jesus existed in Noah's day. He is eternal. At that time, he is pre-incarnate in the time of Noah. That is, he has not yet taken on human flesh. And so, just like Jesus preaches through all preachers of truth and righteousness, he did so through Noah as well. In fact, Noah is called a preacher of righteousness over in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. That terminology is used of Noah. We, we know that in the days of Noah, by both word and deed, Noah preached. He preached to the sinful people of his generation of judgment to come. Those people did not, did not respond. They did not obey, according to the opening words of verse 20 of our text. Even though God was patient, even though he waited patiently for them to give them chance after chance, they did not repent. All the time that Noah and his family were building the ark, according to God's instruction, uh, the sinful world at that time had a chance to repent and be saved from the wrath that was coming, from this flood of waters that God was preparing to cleanse the world. At least a century they had to make a decision to follow God, but they did not do it. Only eight did. Noah, his wife, and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. Eight people in a world that we imagine involved millions. Eight so Peter says, in spirit, Jesus went and preached through Noah righteousness to that sinful world, and they refused it. They disobeyed. They spat upon God's patience, you see. They ignored his word. And so in the end, just eight people were saved from the deluge in the ark. All the rest perished in the flood. When you think about that, maybe the, 
the saddest episode in human history. A worldwide cataclysm that could have been avoided. And now our writer Peter gets to his main point, which is baptism is like this. It's like the story of the ark. In fact, he says, baptism now saves you. And I can hear the objections from people. You know, but we're saved by faith. Oh, but we're saved by grace. Yes, and yes. And Peter says, we're saved by baptism. Have you ever thought about this in... in the religious world, the Christian religious world today among Christian groups, who those who truly believe, uh, claim to believe the Bible, they believe it's inspired, they read it, they preach it whenever they assemble, uh, they affirm that it contains the word of God and its truth. Among these groups, of which there are a bunch meeting, you know, around us in this county this morning, we share great agreement with them on most every step one must take to be saved from their sin. Now we all say that a person obviously must hear the good news. We all agree that a person has to believe in Jesus. Everyone thinks it's needful to stop sinning, to repent of sin, and also to be willing to confess faith in Jesus, but the dividing line is baptism. That's where Satan has set a roadblock. That's where he has blinded the minds and the eyes of people to the truth. So in a sense, it's obvious that the enemy doesn't care if you do everything else as long as he can, for whatever reason, keep you from being baptized into Jesus, the enemy is content. If he can keep you from doing that, why? Because once you are truly baptized into Christ, Satan truly loses you. As Peter says it, baptism now saves you. How many people in the world of religion today would prefer that that phrase be stricken from God's word because it contradicts their preconceived notions that they have brought to the, to the scripture. But who are we going to trust? God's word or some preachers? Are we going to trust some church's word? Believe me, I am not asking you to believe me today. I'm asking you to hear God's word. And God's word says today, baptism now saves you. Now, is, is baptism somehow magic? You know, these waters that we use to baptize people are they fill, filled with some kind of spiritual potion that, um, you know, work in a way that wh whoever we immerse in them, whoever we put into them, no matter what, they're transformed into a saved person? Certainly not. You know, if that was the case, what I would be doing is grabbing the most burly guys in here and go find those of you who have never been baptized and throw you in that water. I'd be justified in doing so just as much as firemen would be justified in yanking you out of a house that's burning down and for some reason you don't want to come out. If it's just a matter of magic, you get in the water and everything's good, but that's not the case. If the water's magic, we get a whole lot more people saved by forcing it upon them. But that's not 
the deal. Peter says, the water's not magic. Look again at verse 21. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. It is a spiritual thing that happens when we are baptized, you see. It's a spiritual thing that takes place. Yes, baptism is a physical act. We're physically immersed in water. But the thing that happens that's important is a spiritual thing. God works salvation into us when we're baptized into Christ. It's not magic. It's something greater. It's the power of God. Where did that power come from? From the work of Jesus on the cross. Look at verse 18. He was put to death, bearing our sins in the flesh, but he was raised in the spirit. We, in baptism, have our flesh buried under the water, but we are raised to a new spiritual life. Two really significant things that Peter underlines about baptism here are first, the power of it, the saving power of baptism, and that it is totally based on the redeeming, atoning work of Christ on the cross. That's where the power comes. Baptism without that work is powerless and useless. It's not just, uh, it, it, it's just getting wet without the shed blood of Jesus. And second, the power of baptism is made true by the faith response of the person submitting to baptism. Again, verse 21, it is an appeal to God, it says, and it's through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Does one have to believe, have faith, in order to be saved. Absolutely. Baptism is worthless without belief. One must totally believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved. But here's another question. Does one have to be baptized in order to be saved? Absolutely. What Peter writes here makes no sense whatsoever if that's not the case. There is no such thing in the New Testament as an unbaptized Christian. They're all baptized. There's, you know, one of the greatest conversions of all time is the Apostle Paul. And I just ask you to recall the circumstances after he came to believe in Jesus, he believed, and there's a period of time, three days in which he fasted and prayed before a preacher came, a preacher named Ananias, came to him and he said, and now why do you wait? Arise and be baptized, call, calling on the name of the Lord, washing away your sins, Acts 22, verse 16. So just believing in Jesus didn't wash away his sins. He had believed for three days. The Lord had appeared to him in a blinding vision. And Paul had believed for three days. And then just doing religious stuff, like praying and fasting, and I imagine worshiping God in that time, didn't wash away his sins. He had been doing that all along as well. He needed to get up and be baptized, in so doing, calling on the Lord in faith to save him from his sins, and thus indeed his sins would be washed away because of Jesus' shed blood on the cross. Peter just says it in a shorter, more compact way here in our passage. Um, he says it, I guess in four words, baptism now saves you. In Noah's day, what saved? 
Well, the eight that were saved believed God. They did what God asked. They built an ark. And thus they were saved through the floodwaters based on what they believed and what they did. That is what we call saving faith. Peter says here in our passage that baptism corresponds to that. It's like that. It's important what you believe. Do you believe this morning that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? If so, God bless you. Bless you for that. That is really, really important to believe. It's probably the most important truth to believe in the universe, that Jesus is the Son of God. But what have you done in response to that truth? Have you responded? Have you been baptized into Christ? Baptism now saves you. Don't you want to be saved? From the wrath to come? Jesus is getting ready to return to judge the world. He doesn't want to send anybody to a devil's hell. But sadly, he is going to send most people there because they have never been washed in his blood. Only eight people were saved from the flood in Noah's day amongst millions. Few will be saved at Jesus' second coming. But today, you have heard about God's new ark, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You've heard the truth this morning. Will you be baptized today? Imagine being in Noah's day. Being one of those people who heard him preach. But being left out of the ark by your own stubborn choice. Imagine what it had to be like when the rain came. And the waters came from above and below. And you had refused to heed the warning. That is the definition of being lost. Let me ask you a question. Would God have saved the eight? Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. If, even though they believed in God, they refused to get on the ark before the door was closed. Would he have saved them? But there are all kinds of people today who will tell you that you can be saved without being baptized into Christ, our spiritual ark. There are all kinds of people who believe those who say that. See, baptism is, is not just a good thing to do. It's not just a good work. It's not just a, another act of Christian obedience. It is not just an outward sign of an inward grace. No. God's word says baptism now saves you. Baptism is how you get on the ark before the flood hits. Baptism is how you find safety in Christ Jesus. You have heard the truth this morning. If you have believed on the Lord Jesus, why do you now wait? Why do you wait? Rise up and be baptized, washing away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. 
Do it today. Today is the day of salvation. I cannot promise you another opportunity to come. Only this one right now. Only this one. While we stand. While we sing.